it, it has a hook on it. So it can hook, I can hold my hand like that and it can, the end of it can hook around, I think, this finger. I remember it should feel like an extension of my hand. Schindler's List. In Schindler's List, I played Armand Gert, who was the commandant of a Nazi labor camp in, uh, outside Krakow in Poland. I hadn't done, I'd done maybe two feature films before. I'd, I remember being struck by Stephen's extraordinary knowledge of the technique of filmmaking, which in my very limited experience, I hadn't experienced anyone being so vocal about lenses and how they're going to shoot and we'll do it like this and put a dolly down here. I mean, I, and it was exciting because it felt like someone was unashamedly vocal about their process as, as it was happening. And I remember he said to me, I'm shooting this, I've made no storyboards, I'm just shooting this. Obviously he knew his script inside out, but he was allowing himself to be inventive on the day. That's what he said. He said, you yeah, know, I've just directed Jurassic Park, everything's storyboarded to the nth degree, this is the opposite. And the energy of that oppositeness was his aliveness. And it was, you know, he was very vocal and um, demanding a lot of the crew, but it was, it was exciting. I tried to do as much research as I could, based on Thomas Keneally's book, Schindler's Ark, originally, then it was called Schindler's List. But I mean, the Imperial War Museum here in London, there's quite a lot of documentation about Schindler and Goethe. And I think what I came away with, this is a man who had a, he drank a lot, Armand Goethe. I think he was, uh, and he ate a lot. And the scene with M. Beth Davids playing Helen Hirsch in the cellar. I would like so much to reach out and touch you in your loneliness. What, what, that, what would that be like, I wonder? I mean, <laughs> what would be wrong with that? And I, I realize that you're not a, a person in the, the strictest sense of the word, but... That was, um, it was quite a challenging... It was a beautifully written scene. I just remember the challenge of a man who's suddenly finding someone designated in his eyes as unacceptable. He sees all that prejudice starts to slightly crack, possibly because of he's allowing an attraction or a desire to come to the surface. I mean, it, it was felt, feels very human. The Harry Potter series. I hadn't invested time in reading the books. I knew there was a Harry Potter huge thing happening, but I hadn't seen the earlier film, so I, I had no sense. It was only when my sister, who has children, said, don't you realize what they're asking you to do? It's extraordinary. And I saw, and then I took it a bit more seriously. I, I wasn't that aware. No, when it was first proposed to me, I, is this, do I like this part? What does it involve? You know, who, <laughs> is it something I, I would enjoy playing? And I did in the end, yeah. yeah. You're a fool, Harry Potter. And you will lose. She describes the voice in a couple of places at least, which was a good indicator of where to go. And the snake-like idea that J.K. Rowling gives him as someone that he himself has snake-like elements to his movement. Silky, smooth, silent. With Stuart Craig, who is the the production designer and his team, we discussed what the wand would be. It has a hook on it. So it can hook, I can hold my hand like that, and it can, the end of it can hook around, I think, this finger. And so it can sort of, I can almost have the hand open, so it would, you would think it might fall off the hand, but it, um, I don't know, I just enjoyed the, the thing that it could, it could be light in the hand. I didn't, I didn't have as much prosthetic makeup as people think I did. They removed my nose digitally later on. So I was covered in coloured dots and then I had to sit in front of cameras and every angle recorded and then for the, the digital expert. Mark Coulier was the makeup artist for me and his team. Gave me a white, pale, pale, sort of sickly complexion, but then they had these sort of vein-like paintwork, which was actually transfers, so they could have consistency. So they just sponge the transfers onto my scalp and face to give this sort of slightly 
translucent vein-like quality to the, to my, the sickly pallor. Seen at the table when I talk about muggles. To her, the mixture of magical and muggle blood is not an abomination, but something to be encouraged. And then the snake comes up along, and that, that, I love that scene. I think it's the beginning of the first part of Deathly Hallows. Nagini. Dinner. That was a great scene. And I love shooting the death duel. That was cool, with Daniel in the, in the big courtyard. That was epic. What's that like? How do you get yourself in that moment, you know, and you, do you visualize the blasts coming from your wand? And you just have to hate Harry Potter. There's a deep loathing. <laughs> I'd be I'd be pissed if they brought back Voldemort and didn't ask me. Coriolanus. The sort of decision to direct came indirectly. <laughs> I was close to a great producer called Simon Channing Williams, who produced all Mike Lee films until sadly he died. He had a project which he tried to make with me, but it didn't work. That initial process of script conversations and some location scouts and starting to put on the hat of a director, that gave me a kind of confidence to reach into an idea in my back pocket, which I had had, that if I ever would direct, it would be this, that Shakespeare played Coriolanus, which is not often done, not, I wouldn't say it's one of his most popular plays. It's a very antagonistic, confrontational, elitist, central uh, protagonist, but fascinating play about politics and power and people. <laughs> With Coriolanus, I definitely reference Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet as a very bold, exciting modernization, using Shakespeare's text, but committing to a modern um, world. I want desperately want audiences to feel that whatever the language might be doing, that the emotions and the actions and the motivations are ones we carry in us today. I will fight against my country. And then men die. But it was, a, it was a tricky sell. My first film, obviously easily labelled as vanity project for this actor and all that stuff. And it was scary directing myself. The challenge was I mustn't, I mustn't spend too much time indulging myself. I had a bit of a, 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 a clock in my head when I was doing coverage on myself. I feel the responsibility to nurture the other actors and their performances really. And that's one of the pleasures, actually. Grand Budapest Hotel. I'd met Wes a couple of times. He'd been extremely friendly to me and supportive. I'd shown him an early uh, mood reel, or what they call a sizzle reel, of Coriolanus when I was trying to make it and get funding. He had been very supportive and encouraging about it as an idea. But that was in a social situation. And so some years later, now, you know, um, three or four years later, he's sending me the script. And he had a eccentric approach, which, which would say, please read the script and tell me which character you'd like to play. <laughs> well, I think this one, maybe. <laughs> that was a very happy experience with, with the way Wes works with his ensemble of actors, Edward Norton, Willem Dafoe. And I think everyone is there because they love the spirit of his films. Many of the hotel's most valued and distinguished guests came for him. I love you. I love you. She was dynamite in the sack, by the way. She was 84. Mm, I've had older. I remember definitely thinking of who, who, who do I know that are Monsieur Gustave like? And there, there is actually, it's supposedly based on a mutual acquaintance that I know, Wes knows, uh, who um, came to the set. And, and I knew, I don't, I don't mimic him, but I suppose I'm aware of this person's energy and demeanor that I've taken it on board. Sunshine. Sunshine is directed by a great Hungarian director, Istvan Szabo. And uh, Istvan asked me to be in this film, which is a story of a Jewish family's assimilation. 
in the 20th century in Budapest in Hungary. Istvan Szabo said to me, this film is about the disease of wanting to be accepted. Who are you trying to please? I have to please our family and the memory of our rabbi grandfather. I have to please the government and its opposition. I have to please our brother who wants to turn the world upside down and our father who wants to keep the world exactly as it is. You play multiple characters. I do, I play three. There was differences in facial hair and haircut, I think. But I thought, no, that shouldn't be. If the film, the storytelling and the filmmaking is clear enough, the audience not, will know. It didn't seem at all the sort of film where the actor completely changes and, oh my God, is it really him, her, whatever? It was, no, no, you meant to know it's me. You're meant to understand that, you know, it's the same family. It's the, the fact that I'm playing all three was the linking element. White Crow. White Crow is about the um, defection of Rudolf Nureyev for the events leading up to him his defection. So this great Russian ballet dancer who was arguably like a sort of equivalent to a pop star in the world of ballet. And I grew up with, I was, never saw him dance, but I grew up with his name being mentioned as the god of ballet or of male, of male ballet dancers. I was given the um, early chapters of a new biography about Nureyev and when I read about him, and it wasn't because I had a love of ballet, it was because of his spirit. And that's what drew me to him. A very confrontational spirit, often very difficult and, and uh, abrasive and uh, arguably abusive to people. And I found it a very moving story. And I talked to the right screenwriter, David Hare, who you will know from films like The Hours and The Reader that I did. And David responded to the idea of writing. So we worked together on that. I learned from the first film, Coriolanus, to not to be afra afraid of getting a lot of coverage, to take time to go for a few more takes if I needed to, even if it meant pushing the overtime button a bit. There's a Japanese director called Ozu who has these very simple classic frames and it's probably very unfashionable. I mean, I love films that, where the camera moves, but, but the principle of the frame that can hold the characters or close up. On White Crow, we have three time frames so I, I, that principle of the sort of classic frame in the camera that either moves on a track or is locked off or is, was applicable to the Leningrad time frames where Rudolf Nureyev is a student. And then when he's in Paris, it's more immediate. So then with Mike Ely, the brilliant cinematographer who shot that, we, a lot of it's in the hand. So it's kind of caught moments or found and the camera has permission to be a bit messy as it looks for the best way to discover a scene between characters. My name is Rudolf Nureyev. I want political asylum. No! Shooting ballet, which was, I was way out of my comfort zone. I wanted an unknown to play Nureyev and I wanted a dancer to play Nureyev because, um, but it was principally an acting part. So persuading people to cast a total unknown, who's not even, a un, not even an actor by training in the lead, that was really difficult. This was never a film about his dance career, it was always about what it is in the person, I suppose in an artist or a performer, that makes them determined to go there, and, and, and often necessarily ruthless in their pursuit of excellence. A bigger splash. Harry Hawks yeah. is the character our uh, great script by David Kaganich, Luca Guadagnino directed myself, Tilda Swinton, who plays um, a rock star who, with whom I have been in love. She's with her current boyfriend, Matthias, played by Matthias Schönertz, and, and set on an island called Pantelleria. And we shot it on the real Pantelleria, which is an island between Sicily and Tunisia. But I love this part, this sort of... Um, um, he's a music producer of a certain type, quite mouthy and in your face. Um, and was there anyone from your life that you used as inspiration for Harry? Well, a little bit my brother Magnus, who is a <laughs> music producer and composer, but a little bit of Magnus. But also just it, it leapt off the page about who Harry was. Yeah, and I just loved Luca's approach. And when I first met Luca and he talked about it and the part was great on the page and I just like Luca's filmic intelligence and his inquiry and uh, he, he's properly creative on a set and 
and he does what he loves. He thinks very beautifully filmically. He respects the journey of the characters whilst, I mean, there are some filmmakers who you can, their direction sort of smothers the life of characters with fancy camera work or funny editing choices or. The English Patient. On The English Patient, we all, meaning the actors with Anthony and the crew, we all believed in the emotional sort of breadth and scope of it. It all felt like a, a, a drama that had visual scope and emotional scope and but it, at the time I mean it was hard to finance because none of the protagonists were in the eyes of the Hollywood establishment none of us were insurance stars right. we were all up-and-comers so it didn't jump out at the people with the purses it was in fact Harvey Weinstein who saved it yeah. with through Miramax he came in and and saved it because it was it was going down just before we were due to start I have a happy memory of being in great locations, in being in Rome for a while, then going to Tuscany, then going to Venice for a short time, then going to Tunisia, going to the Sahara. So it's suddenly in this desert landscape. Clifton had offered to fly down from Cairo to collect me. He flew like a madman always, so I, I took no notice. I don't think now, with the way independent films or that sort of adult drama character-led films the sort of budget would be hard now you'd we'd probably have to shoot it in half the time we shot from september to january 90 1995 to january 96. the constant gardener it's a john le carre story um produced by simon channing williams who i talked about earlier who came to me with the project simon brought in um, Fernando Morelos, who was very, the, he was being talked about for the um, City of God. And I thought that was an inspired choice because there's a kind of mm, Englishness that sits with John le Carre's work, which is great. I could see how an English director would confirm certain stereotypes. I mean, the whole thing was, had a looseness and a documentary like feel which um, shook it and I think shook it away from the pages of, of a book, which is what you, I think you need that. How are you? How are you? We can't involve ourselves in their lives, Tess. There are millions of people, they all need help. Justin Quayle, his name. He's a certain type of self-effacing Englishman of a certain sort of middle-classness, I suppose. Well-mannered, charming, possibly thought of as ineffectual and um, you know, not someone to shoulder their way to the front of a queue, not someone who pushes forward their ambition, but is decent and in, reveals himself to have a, a core of steel and determination in trying to avenge or get to this, at least to the, the secret of his wife's murder. The appeal to me was here is a guy that everyone thinks is a bit soft, actually has a kind of extraordinary courage. And I love that movement, you know, this is someone who no one thinks but he pursues and pursues and pursues and pursues. I'm not conscious that I have the same approach for every part because often the director you're working with informs the approach you might take. A lot of the time I feel things intuitively. I think about who they are, I think about their inner life, where are they from, who are their parents, what, you know, you, you can give yourself imagination exercises. People ask about research, but actually there is research, but actually a lot of it I think is just intu intuition and imagination.